So in the past, I called this lecture on post-processing operations um, something along the lines of post-processing operations or why you can't train a monkey to do our jobs, right? Um, or in other words, a question that you've maybe heard in the clinical slides, why are you getting a bachelor's degree when all you need is an associate's degree to be an x-ray tech? Has anyone ever said that to you? Yeah, so this lecture is in part designed to address those types of questions and to make a defense for why we need to have a bachelor's in science or health sciences in order to fully understand what's happening with the changes in radiography and in radiation therapy. And largely, that's in service of the patient. Um, the, the target has shifted in the last 10 to 20 years in terms of what the actual role of radiation therapists and uh, radi radiologic technologists is. Uh, in the past, our, our goal as x-ray techs in particular was to be able to control um, radiographic technique such that we could produce um, high quality film images. Um, and that it gave us a very narrow window for using technique because of the limits of the film screen system. And then the second part of our goal was to reduce patient dose. What happened with the advent of digital is that um, we no longer are using radiographic technique as the primary means for controlling image quality. We're using computer processes to control for image quality. Um, and so our goal has shifted now to reducing patient dose, and frankly, we're failing at it. We're doing a really poor job at that. Um, so I want to talk about why that's the case. But before we can do that, we need to look at some objectives here. So we're going to discuss some key impacts of computer image manipulation, how that, how that changes our image evaluation, and also how it affects patient dose. Um, we'll look at the obstacles that industry has encountered with rolling out a standardized exposure indicator. Um, one now exists, but it still is kind of in that murky haze between policy and application. We'll look at terminology related to some user-defined post-processing operations. So some of this will be repeat, but it's, it's stuff that we need to repeat so that we make sure we're, we're rock solid on it, because frankly, it should be kind of the, the give me questions for the digital imaging sections of the registry. And then we'll talk about how to evaluate our pictures and make sure that they're good. And that may seem like a really obvious one, but it's not. Um, like case in point, if you've ever had a technologist look at a picture, a digital image, and say, yeah, that looks good, right, without looking at an exposure indicator, they don't know what they're talking about. I'm not trying to be mean, but they, they don't know how to evaluate a digital image. Because there's no way to look at a di digital image and determine whether or not there was sufficient technique unless you're evaluating the exposure indicator. And most technologists aren't looking at the exposure indicator. If you ask them what is the exposure indicator, they couldn't tell you. So you may have already detected this is something I feel kind of passionately about. And the reason for that is because um, I'm a Gen Xer, right? And I'm, I'm here to like take down the man or whatever from the matrix. Now the real reason is that this stuff rolled out while I was a student. I received a really, really basic education in digital imaging and things like things of that nature. Most of my education was in how film screen technology works and how to develop images and I, ha I knew all about the chemistry of processors and developer equipment and that's what I worked with. I worked in a dark room where you'd actually run images, you'd run film screen and, and process the films that way. But then the sea change happened in the course of my employment where all of a sudden we weren't doing that and we brought the techniques that we that had worked for film screen into the digital age and it would be almost like a caveman trying to learn how to drive a car, right? But imagine if a caveman, rather than trying to learn how to drive a car, tried to learn how to drive like a self-driving car, right? The caveman would assume that the methods for riding horses or whatever were working for the self-driving car, but they don't. It's a totally different technology, right? That's what's kind of going on in the hospitals right now, is as x-ray techs, we are a lot of cavemen thinking that we know how to drive self-driving cars, and we just don't. And evidence of that are these two key impacts that he points out in the textbook. The first is that 
Neither brightness nor contrast of the digital image can be attributed entirely to the radiographic technique. So everything you've learned about KVP and mass is wrong. No, I'm just joking. It's not wrong. It still is important. But um, it, has, it has not had the impact that it used to have when we were using film screen. And now what's shifted, like I said before, is minimizing patient and public radiation exposure is now the primary benefit of requiring certification for radiographers, right? So technique has become untethered from actually setting KVP and mass because the digital system can do so much to augment um, inappropriate technique. And now the name of the game is trying to reduce patient exposure, public exposure to radiation. Now, before we um, drill down into that, uh, I want to mention a, a theorem that's been around for a long, 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 long time, right? Because it definitely kind of explains, uh, at least the, in the abstract, what, what's going on. And it's, it's called the Nyquist theorem, and we'll come back to it. Um, but you may want to write this down somewhere, maybe on this slide. Nyquist um, theorem has been around since the 1920, since 1920s, and it says that the sampling rate of something needs to be twice the highest frequency reproduced. I'll say that again. The Nyquist theorem says the sampling rate has to be twice the highest frequency reproduced. Otherwise, we get an error. So anytime we're sampling something, which is what we're doing in digital imaging, um, we need to have really two more pixels than what we're trying to sample. Yes? Twice the highest frequency. Twice the highest frequency. You might be wondering, well, what is he talking about? I'm going to pause this for Okay, getting back on track with, with what the book is talking about. Before we can talk about having a standardized exposure indicator, we should talk about speed class. Um, this is also in the reading, and speed is actually mentioned in the ART's discussion about uh, digital radiography. So we'll go ahead and define it. It's a very simple thing. Um, but the speed of any system um, is basically an expression of its sensitivity. How responsive it, is it to radiation exposure? And it's expressed in multiples of 100. Like you can have a speed class 100, 200, 300, 400. That's the general ranks, that there's just those four. 100, 200, 300, 400 speed classes. And it's always inverse to the amount of exposure required to produce um, a signal at the image receptor. Um, and so we used these quite a bit. We had different speed classes that we would use for different applications in film screen, right? Um, so for example, if I was doing uh, something where I needed to see fine detail, I would use a lower speed class, right? I would use like the 100 speed class. Why? Because it was less sensitive, right? So it, re it would record detail at a higher rate, right? It wouldn't get as much noise on it. If I wanted to reduce patient dose, I would use a higher speed class. Why? Because the higher speed class is more sensitive, right? So it does not require as much technique to make a picture. Hey, if you want to take notes, why don't you guys slow down? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. I'll slow one down. Thank you. Thank you. So what I'm looking at is page 541 in our reading. And the sections I've underlined is the very first sentence after speed class. It just defines speed, right? And then there's a part in italics here that says um, this digital speed works pretty much the same way as traditional film screen speed. May I just say something? Yes. In your book is 541. If you're looking at it on the like, page, it's um, 537. 537. 
Thank you. Thank you, thank you. 537 in the, uh, in the reading packet. Now we've, we've officially arrived at kind of a rabbit trail here, right? I, I, we need to define this so that if it pops up on your registry, you're not freaking out, right? Um, and this is the only time that we've had a chance to really talk about it. Uh, so just so you know, in all fairness, speed class, if you see a question about speed class, it may be something like you need to switch from this 100 speed class to a 200 speed class image receptor system, right? And all you would do is just understand that the 200 speed class requires less technique. Just put the 100 over the 200, you can use one half the technique. Okay. So again, it's the sensitivity of the system. The higher the speed class, the less radiation is required. This, the reason I bring it up here is because it gives us the best context for understanding why we didn't initially have a standardized exposure indicator. EI stands for exposure indicator, right? Um, so as we rolled out digital systems across different manufacturers, different platforms, we had a varying, varying types of exposure indicators that these di different manufacturers were producing. Generally, it's based on the median pixel value, so just the mathematical average pixel value, right? So it looks at the histogram, it sees what's at the middle of the histogram, and it says that's your exposure indicator, right? That seems pretty straightforward, but you know, leave it to a boardroom full of guys to make it complicated, right? Which is what happened. So we'll look at some of those complications here in a minute. Where we're at right now, that's just really to give us some, some context. So the context is this. In the past, exposure was largely controlled by the speed class of the film. Speed class still exists. Um, but it's defined normally by department managers. They say, I want our CR or our DR system to operate at this speed class, to be a 200 speed class, right? As we moved closer to using digital more, all the different manufacturers, Agfa, Fuji, Konica, Siemens, um, GE, defined different types of exposure indicators, right? So that brings us up to this current moment where there's a lot of confusion about what an exposure indicator is. We have a lot of technologists that move between different systems and the ways of looking at the exposure indicator on one system like a GE is very different from looking at it on a Fuji system. And so the, um, the American Association of uh, Physics, of uh, physicists, has said we need to make a standardized exposure indicator, right? That's gradually being rolled out as we speak. It's not here yet, but it's coming. And this is something that can be used by all manufacturers um, across all platforms so that all technologists can be on the same page when it comes to looking at an image and saying, yeah, it looks like we used a good technique. What they've proposed is called the deviation index, okay? So don't be confused by these terms. The deviation index is just a standardized exposure indicator. 
and it is based on that median pixel value on the histogram. So you might be wondering, well, what are specifically the obstacles? Why did it get rolled out so weird? Why is it different if I'm working on a Fuji system versus one of the others? Well, the good news is manufacturers are, exposed, are, are adopting the deviation index on all new equipment. So the manufacturers are on board. They're adopting the DI. Hopefully that's, you know, textbooks closed on this chapter of history, we open up a new set of problems, right? For what currently exists out there in your clinical sites, there's three different approaches to exposure indication, right? There's logarithmic scales, proportional scales, and inversely proportional scales. I'm going to talk mostly about the inversely proportional scale because that's primarily what is used at most of the Baptist facilities. So the Fuji system. I'm not trying to ignore the others. I just don't want to overload you with this rabbit trail that we're going down. Right? Um, in the Fuji system, the S number, as if the S number is high, the exposure is too low. And if the S number is low, the exposure was too high. We want to be somewhere in some middle range, normally like 200 to 400 for an S number. What I consistently see when I walk into facilities is S numbers that are too low. Um, and the reason is simple. This goes back to that argument that I've made that our number one job now is to limit patient radiation dose, right? But in the past, our number one job was twofold. It was to get pretty pictures and limit radiation dose. Now, if you're using a digital system, you cannot tell if an image has been overexposed. You cannot look at the picture and say, it's burned out. It can't burn out. Digital systems cannot burn out. You can't tell that you've overexposed it. What you're going to see if it's overexposed is a pretty picture. Right? So that's the first problem. The second problem is you can tell if it's underexposed. It will have quantum model. If the image is underexposed, it will have a grainy appearance that we call quantum model. It's a form of noise. So think with me for just a sec. If in this new system, in the old system, you could tell if it was underexposed or overexposed. If it was underexposed, it looked too light. If it was overexposed, it was just burned out. It looked like burnt toast, right? In the new system, I can tell if it's underexposed, but I can't tell if it's overexposed. The problem is a thing that we call dose creep. What happened consistently is technologists were able to tell, yeah, that image is underexposed. I need to up my technique the next time I shoot a hand x-ray or whatever, right? And the picture looks pretty. So the next time they up their technique again, guess what? The picture looks pretty. I could radiate the patient 200 times over and still get a pretty picture, right? So if you've ever been chewed out by a radiologist or a department manager for having a picture that was too grainy, now you've got your best friend in the world, this x-ray machine that doesn't matter if I fry the patient to death with radiation, I can still get a pretty picture. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. We had more and more technologists recognize this, either intuitively or actually figured this out, and started to realize, I can just burn all the images out and take pretty pictures all day long. I don't have to care anything about technique. So in the textbook, I'm not exactly sure what page it is, but it's exposure indicators. Was it page 540 somewhere in there, Ms. Sims? He gets into a list right here. Should be close to figure 32.3. And it says there's three rules that be, should be used as guidelines for computed radiography and digital radiography. The first is insufficient techniques 
resulting in low exposure indicators can cause unacceptable levels of quantum model. So insufficient techniques, it's not enough image, image technique, I'll get quantum model. Number two, very high exposure indicators reflect an unacceptable, an unacceptable amount of exposure to the patient. You'll still get a pretty picture, but you've overexposed the patient to radiation. Number three, the, num the third rule for us is achieving exposure indicators within the recommended range, it's best to use a high KVP and low mass, right? Of these three, the one that has un been universally adopted is the third one because all the techniques that you memorized at, when you were looking at Merrill's took that into account, that you needed to increase your KVP. So that battle has been won. It's the other two rules that we're struggling with. What to do with an underexposed image and what happens when we overexpose the patient. So the target exposure indicator is somewhere close to that middle range, right? We want to be somewhere in the middle with it. And anytime we are looking at our exposure indicator, it's not telling us really completely whether or not you've got a good picture. So understand that. I am saying look at it, use it as a determination of whether or not the picture's in the ballpark, right, in terms of exposure. But just know that there's other things that can crop up that throw it off. Examples of those are listed here as any kind of pre-processing error, like segmentation, exposure field, where if it doesn't recognize the exposure field, or an error in histogram analysis. If I told it I shot a hand and really I shot an abdomen, it will throw off the exposure indicator. Okay. So it's not something I can just mindlessly follow is the exposure indicator and say, yeah, I must be getting good pictures today. Um, I need to look at the image still and see, it, are there any errors in the way the image was processed? So in answering the question, what is an acceptable exposure indicator? What, what is the right range, right? It's going to be very institution specific. It's going to depend on what your doctors want, in other words. So you'll need to, again, start to have conversations with the radiologists, either as a department or individually, to figure out what is the range of exposure indicators that look good on their monitors, what are ways that we can make sure that we ensure that across all of our different machines. Two general rules of thumb that he talks about that these are, again, anytime we're talking about a rule of thumb, it's not something that's on the registry. This is something that's going to be every day of the rest of your life, right? But the two rules of thumb are underexposed images should not be repeated unless the physician says, I can't read this. The noise is unacceptable. So this means we need to put on our cowboy boots man up or whatever, go into the reading room and say, look, I just shot this hand x-ray. It looks kind of grainy on my screen. Can you still interpret it, right? Own it. Because what you've just learned, if the doctor says, yes, this still looks OK, I can still make an interpretation here, you've just learned what your baseline is, right? That's a really valuable thing to know. If I know what is the minimum technique for a hand x-ray, from there, I can figure out what is minimum technique for just about any other part of the body. It's a really valuable thing to know. So it's worth interrupting the radiologist to ask them that question. If you don't feel comfortable doing that with the radiologists that are in your group, figure out what context you can have that conversation with the radiologist in your department, whether it's through a monthly meeting or what have you, because it's a very, very valuable conversation to have. The second part is overexposed images. If I look at the exposure indicator and I say, yeah, the picture looks good, but I've given the patient twice the amount of radiation they need, right? Um, we should not repeat that unless saturation has occurred. And the saturation means that 
we had so much exposure, we somehow burned out the digital system. It could no longer receive it could no longer receive information. So for those of us who are x-ray techs, you may remember that lab where you were shooting a lateral skull x-ray, right? And you shoot the lateral skull x-ray over and over and over again. You did it with two mass, you did it with 20 mass, and then you did it with 200 mass, right? Um, the image taken at 200 mass still looks pretty, right? Even though that's somewhere between 10 to 20 times the amount of radiation the person needed for that. If you remember, if you were in the lab and, you, and I was, we were talking about it, I may have mentioned that that's roughly a tenth the amount of radiation required to give the patient cataracts. If we did 10 of those lateral x-rays, they would have cataracts, right? So that's a, that's a lot of dose, 10 to 20 times what was required, and we still got a pretty picture. So overexposed images should not be repeated unless saturation has occurred. Now, have you ever been in a facility and it looks like the picture is overexposed? It looks kind of dark. Like, like maybe we shot this one a little bit too, too high a technique or whatever. Well, it's worth pausing there and looking at what's the window level, what's the exposure indicator? Is this just a processing error? Maybe it's perfectly fine in terms of its exposure. Maybe it just got processed wrong. Okay. There are some inappropriate uses of exposure indicators in the deviation index. There's ways that we can misuse this information that I'm giving you. And here's three. Um, even if the images are within that target range, whatever your facility has defined as the target range for exposure, um, the amount of radiographic technique might not be appropriate. So it, it's not telling me, yes, my technique was 100% awesome. It's not telling me that. It's giving me a ballpark again. Things that can throw it off include poor collimation, unusual body habitus, prosthetic devices, and shielding. So pretty much every patient can throw this thing off, is what I just said. The amount of variation that we see in our patient populations can throw this thing off. Um, and so again, to stress, in terms of scientifically what we're talking about, this is an indicator, not a measurement. It's just an indication. It's a very helpful indication, and it can actually help us figure out what appropriate technique would be, but it is not a measure. OK, some terminology we need to be familiar with, and most of this we already have uh, talked about at some degree or another. Um, Windowing. Anytime we're talking about windowing, we're talking about adjustments to the contrast and brightness level, right? So windowing can be defined as adjustments to the contrast and brightness level. And like I've said, anytime we're doing one of these manipulations, we need to be aware that it could be changing the exposure indicator, depending on what system we're working on. At any time we adjust the window or brightness on an image, if we send that to PAX, we've just altered the data set that's sent to PAX. We've actually reduced the amount of windowing and leveling the radiologist can do. So be aware of that. If you're windowing and leveling at the reading station, or I mean at your control station, at the CR reader, or there at the DR, system, if you're changing window and level there, you're limiting the amount of windowing and leveling the radiologists can do on their end. You're reducing the data set size. So on the, on the whole, don't window and level there. If you want to window and level later, it packs fine. It's not affecting anything. Smoothing and edge enhancement. So. This goes back to the discussion of makeup and stuff like this. This would be something like concealer, right? Smoothing would be that concealing type makeup. Um, anytime we're using a smoothing uh, algorithm on an image, we are not recovering lost data. We cannot recover lost data. Um, it's just a way to prevent extreme quantum model from messing up the picture in our ability to interpret it. Edge enhancement is kind of 
the same from the opposite point of view. So edge enhancement, if you want to think about it from makeup point of from makeup terminology, it would be like applying a eyeliner or something like that. It's going to make the eyes kind of come out more from the rest of the face. Edge enhancement just does just the same thing on our x-rays. It makes the lines between bones show up more clearly. Right? Anytime we're using edge enhancement, we're also increasing the image noise. So smoothing cannot recover lost information. Edge enhancement increases image noise. So again, to, to go back to the makeup metaphor, if I apply, if I apply some kind of uh, um, concealer on my cheek or whatever, I cannot recover the lost information of applying that concealer there. The blemish or whatever is there, um, I cannot unblemish it, right? The blemish is there. I'm still putting concealer over it, right? With edge enhancement, it's almost as though if I put eyeliner on my eyes, right, it will make the rest of my face look less clear, right? I'll, I'll notice the eyes more, but the rest of the face I'll lose some of the signal on. So just be aware of that. Dark masking, for the most part, is done automatically on every image that we produce. The image, we've collimated a certain amount, and the computer applies a mat, like a black mat, over the areas that were unexposed on the image receptor. Right? Now, the reason I've thrown that one in here, dark masking, is it's helpful. The reason we do it is because for the radiologists, as they're looking at these images day in, day out, if there was a whole lot of white on the screen, like in addition, like stuff that we've collimated out, but it shows up white in the image, it would actually cause eye fatigue, right? And it's very distracting as well. So the computer applies a, a dark mask over the areas of white on the image just to reduce eye fatigue and eye strain and distractedness from the radiologist's point of view. It can misapply dark masking, right? Um, a classic example of that is on a rib study or anytime we've angled the collimator, it can misapply the dark mask. So we might have to remove it altogether. There's an operation to remove it. Black bone is largely done with fluoro. It's where you switch the histogram around so that you can see um, the bone will be black and air and things like that will be white. Resizing is things like magnification, and then image stitching, the most common application for that is a scoliosis series. So if anyone's been at some of the ortho orthopedic clinics, they apply image stitching to scoliosis series so they can see the entire spine and make measurements along the entire spine um, for surgical planning or for uh, patient history. And again, I'll just repeat, make sure you check out that ART um, glossary of standard definitions for uh, terms like related to spatial resolution, contrast resolution, and uh, what digital radiography is. Okay, the last thing, and again, some of this will be a, it will be a repeat, but it's helpful because in saying that we've kind of untethered technique from the pictures, still want to make sure that um, we're understanding how to evaluate our images. Um, so the first thing we can do when we look at a picture, apart from looking at the exposure indicator, so the very first thing I generally look at is an exposure indicator. Am I in the ballpark? Right? Okay, I'm in the ballpark. Now, how do, how do I look at the picture itself? Well, I look at the picture values for the area that I'm interested in. Like, so for the chest x-ray, for the area of the lungs, the heart, and the ribs, no part of it should be completely black or completely white. It should be somewhere in the range of grays, right? Um, should not be completely blacked out. Should not be completely uh, whited out either. It shouldn't be silhouetting, particularly if I'm looking at the chest. The, the mediastinum should not appear to be a silhouette, just a white whiteness, right? It should. I should be able to see a portion of the, th of the thoracic spine through the heart. 
Contrast and grace and grayscale should be maximized for the visualization of anatomic detail. What that means is whatever's an appropriate contrast level for this anatomy, that's what I want to see, right? So if I'm mostly interested in bone, it can be pretty high contrast. If I'm interested in soft tissue, it needs to be pretty low contrast. There should be a maximum signal to noise ratio. M mostly signal, less noise, which comes from having a sufficient KVP, right? There should be maximum spatial resolution. No part of the image should appear to be grainy. There should not be artifacts. I should be talking to my patient, making sure that they've removed any metal that they can remove from the area of interest, right? Um, and those can sometimes be awkward conversations, right? If we're doing a C-spine, asking someone if they have uh, like dentures or something like that, if there's a weave or a wrap in their hair, we need to ask those hard questions to make sure that those things aren't gonna show up on our image. And then finally, we wanna minimize distortion. That's all the geometrical stuff. So appropriate um, focal spot size, appropriate SID, appropriate angulation, all of those things. Um, should be evaluated on the image. All right, thank y'all.